I'm really delighted to welcome you to this webinar on social dialogue for the transition from the informal to the formal economy. This webinar is the second in the Global Deal series of webinars that we are organizing to present the findings of our thematic briefs and highlight good practices among Global Deal partners. Uh, some of you may have attended the webinar we organized about two weeks ago, uh, which was focusing on COVID-19 and partner responses uh, to this crisis. We will also have one webinar on the future of work later this month, uh, but today we're going to focus on the informal economy. The lack of decent working condition is a huge challenge for, for the over 2 billion workers that earn their livelihoods in the informal economy. That is over 60% of the world's working population. Both women and men are affected, but women are more exposed to informality in low and lower middle income countries. Informal employment represents 90% of total unemployment in low income countries. 67% in middle income countries and 18% in high income countries. So even if informal work is more widespread in poor countries, uh, it's also a big concern to more developed countries. But we shouldn't forget that the informal economy also includes informal enterprises. And actually they constitute 80% of all enterprises in the world. They are characterized by low productivity, low rates of savings and investment, and little or no capital accumulation, which make them vulnerable to economic shocks. The COVID-19 pandemic is having a huge impact on labor markets around the world, but workers in informal employment are particularly vulnerable as they have limited access to health services and social protection. They face a high risk of falling into poverty and experience greater challenges in regaining their livelihoods when restrictions are lifted. So the aim of today's webinar is really to discuss how social dialogue can support the formalization of the economy and present good practices developed by Global Deal partners that can serve as inspiration for others. And we will start with the presentation of the Global Deal Brief on Social Dialogue for the Transition from the Informal to the Formal Economy by Yusuf Gelab, who is one of the authors of the paper and he's also head of the Social Dialogue and Tripartism Unit at the ILO. We will then continue with the presentation by Jane Barrett on Social Dialogue for Decent Work and Gender Equality. Jane is Director of Organization and Representation at the NGO Women in Formal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, Diego. And she will discuss the impact of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic, on informal workers, as well as highlighting some good practices from their work. After Jane, we will listen to Gonzalo Jimenez Coloma. He is advisor in the Directorate of the Labor and Social Security Inspectorate State Agency in Spain. His presentation will focus on the Spanish government's engagement together with the social partners to curb the informalization of formal jobs and share some good practices with us. And last but not least, I will invite Jose Antonio Campo, who is professor at Columbia University and Global Deal senior advisor to respond to the three presentations, as well as sharing his knowledge on how to support the transition to the formal economy, while also addressing the impact of COVID-19 on informal workers. And as Anna mentioned, after these four interventions, we will open up the meeting for a discussion with the speakers. So you're all very welcome to ask questions, make comments or share good practices. And I would also like to remind our speakers to please try to stick to the allotted time so that we will have sufficient time for discussion at the end. But now I would like to turn to Yusuf Gelab for his presentation of the Global Deal Brief on social dialogue for the transition from the informal to the formal. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Veronica, for uh, these uh, introductory remarks. Also, uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity given to, 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 to the ILO, to me, to present the, uh, the brief uh, that uh, addresses the issue of uh, social dialogue for the transition from the informal to the formal economy. Uh, just to say uh, at the outset that this brief is a result of uh, collective 
efforts made by many colleagues uh, in the ILO and coordinated by the dialogue unit. And I'd like to mention here in particular the, the, my colleague, uh, uh, Caroline O'Reilly, who uh, played an important role in the drafting of this brief, but also many, many other colleagues that are cited in the, in the, in the brief coming from different units. And some of them are even more expert than I do when it comes to the, uh, uh, the issue and the subject of the informal economy. So uh, let me start by saying that uh, supporting workers and enterprises in the informal economy has been a very long-standing uh, policy concern for the ILO. As you may know, it was back in 1972 that the first ILO employment mission to Kenya, led by two uh, 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 colleagues, former colleagues, Hans Singer and Richard Jolly, highlighted the potential of the informal sector to create employment and reduce poverty. In their then 600-page report, they noted how the traditional sector of the economy had expanded to include profitable and efficient enterprises alongside marginal subsistence-oriented activities. Back then, also many analysts and commentators believed that the informal sector was a temporary phenomenon that would disappear along with economic growth and development. I think when we look backward, obviously history has proven that such belief or prediction was wrong. Nearly half a century later, the informal economy has not disappeared or even diminished. It is still vast, still growing in many places around the world and transforming, transforming itself in many different ways. And I think, Veronica, you mentioned a couple of uh, figures and facts that prove that, uh, you know, how important, how vast and still growing is the informal economy in many places. And I just would like to, to uh, recall a couple of uh, you know, facts and figures. For example, we still have 2 billion women and men. That makes 61% of the world's employment population still living, still making their living in the informal economy. And also informality affects all countries in all regions, including developed ones. In Africa, nearly 86% of all employment is informal. And that and the figure reaches 68% in Asia Pacific. So, and also we can talk about also the, the gender dimension of the informality by, by region. Globally, more men than women work informally, but in low income countries, a higher proportion of women than men are in informal employment. Also, as you mentioned, many employees uh, are, of course, uh, in the informal sector, but also employers also represent less than 3% of all those in, formal, in informal employment. So yet globally, half of all employers are, the, are in the informal economy. And in Africa, the figure is as high as 80% you mentioned. I had the figure of 78%, but almost the same. So what does uh, informality mean for workers and economic units? I think we all agree here that, you know, for workers being in formal employment, usually means low and unstable incomes, no social protection, poor working conditions, and absence of fundamental rights at work, and exclusion from any making decision-making processes. The same for employers, they are also excluded from decision-making processes, but also it means for them low productivity, reduced access to finance and other business services, and unfair competition for regulated businesses. Also, it represents a challenge for government. It means for governments a loss of fiscal revenues and social security contributions. And also it does undermine the rule of law. So therefore, there is a shared interest among the ILO three chapter constituents in addressing together the, in the, the question of the informality and promoting transition towards for formality. And that explains why in 2015, government and representative workers in choirs organizations came together at the International Labour Conference to adopt the recommendation 204 on the transition from the informal to the formal economy. And this instrument builds on progress made in previous chapter discussions, notably in 2002 at the level of the ILO. Very briefly, I think to, 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 to explain uh, uh, about the recommendation 204, in fact, it promotes an inclusive approach to the issue of uh, uh, promoting uh, formalization, and it set out three interrelated policy objectives. First is to facilitate the transition of workers and economic units 
from the informal to the formal economy. Second, to promote enterprises and decent jobs in the formal economy. And thirdly, to prevent the informalization of formal sector jobs. And uh, based on the uh, uh, stipulations uh, included in that recommendations, countries around the world are acting to achieve these objectives set out in the recommendation through the various means at their, at their disposal and in many, in many places with the support of the ILO. And as you mentioned also, Veronica, the COVID-19 crisis is adding even greater urgency to those efforts that are being made in many countries to promote the formalization of workers and economic units. And our ILO analysis is showing already that those in the informal economy are suffering the most from the consequences of this COVID-19 related crisis. So again, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's put even more emphasis on the importance of pursuing the efforts in, uh, towards formalization. Coming to the, to the theme of this, uh, of this webinar and the presentation of the thematic brief, in that brief, what we did is we, we argue very strongly that social dialogue between government and the representative of employers and workers must be part and parcel of all efforts to tackle informality and to chart a path for progressive formalization. We do describe how recommendations 204 spell out the st strongly, very strongly, the role of social dialogue. This instrument underlines the importance of a freedom of association, employers and workers' organizations, and social dialogue role, including collective bargaining, in enabling and supporting the transition to the formal economy. Also, we do emphasize that the recommendation does not prescribe any model or ways in which this social dialogue should be conducted at the level of member states. This is left to uh, each member state and chapter that constituent, depending on the national context, the extent and the nature of informality, and also the institutional landscape in place to uh, organize their social dialogue around this objective of promoting formalization. However, we do also, ex we do also explain that the basic principle remain that the same whatsoever the national context is. So why there is no model, there is no single approach, there are uh, certain basic principles. And it is, and among these principles is that it is only through social dialogue that the real issues and challenges facing the workers and employers involved and affected by the transition to the formal economy can be brought to the table, discussed, and also sensible and workable solutions developed and uh, eventually implemented. Also, because of the complex nature of the challenges involved in the transition to the formality, social dialogue might need to happen at different levels and in ways different maybe to those applied for confronting other social or economic policy challenges. For example, on the government side, ministries other than the Ministry of Labor might need to be also at the table for example, ministries of trade and industry, economy, justice, finance, and planning. So they need to be at the table of the social dialogue with workers and employers organizations. On the workers' side, it is important for trade unions to redouble their efforts to reach out to the many existing membership-based organizations of workers in the informal economy so that their concerns and priorities are and can be fully taken on board. For employers organizations, it is important to be able to represent the voices and interests of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, both those in the informal economy who need assistance in their efforts to comply with laws and regulations, as well as the formal enterprises, which face unfair competition from their unregulated counterparts. And drawing on cases from all over the, the, the places, there are cases from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, and from uh, also the Americas, uh, also showing uh, different approaches and also different, uh, different uh, initiatives taken by government, employers, or workers' organizations. The brief illustrates how social dialogue involving the chapter actors has in different ways and at different levels contributed to the transition to formality and the reduction of decent work deficits in the informal economy. So these examples shows clearly that you know through social dialogue we, we can achieve, we can I think move the forward the objective of promoting formalization. So in so doing, 
and through presenting all these examples, the brief aims also to increase understanding of the role of social dialogue in the design and implementation of effective formalization strategies in the context of the ILO Declaration on the Future of Work, the relevant international labor standards, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So it is in the framework of this, of this instrument, and also this document, this policy document, that also social dialogue can be applied in designing policies, appropriate policies and strategies towards formalization. Also, what we, we said in, in, in that brief is, as the ILO, what we want to see by showing these examples and these good practices, we want to see more of such examples of social dialogue being successfully used at all levels, in all regions, in all types of countries concerned by this question of uh, uh, formalization to deliver on the objective of transition to the formal economy, ranging from the macro level in the design of policy frameworks and roadmaps, right down to the micro level for finding practical solutions and also specific solutions to the challenges in particular localities, sectors, enterprises, and workplaces. So we want, to, I think, uh, to conclude uh, in the ILO uh, through this brief uh, uh, that we, we have done for the Global Deal is, yes, these examples show that, yes, through social dialogue, through effective social dialogue, based on, 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 on the existence of a free, independent, and representative compliance and workers' organizations, but also committed government, we can, I think, move forward the objective of uh, promoting formalization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf, um, for this overview. I think that was very useful as a background for the discussion we will have. And it was also good that you pointed to the ILO recommendation, uh, which of course is very important. Uh, now, uh, we, I would like to turn to our next speaker, Jane Barrett. She's going to focus on social dialogue for decent work and gender equality, and also highlight some good practices from Diego's work. Jane, the floor is yours. Ah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Yusuf, for a very useful introduction to the brief, which I really want to encourage all participants to read, because this afternoon, both my input and that of Gonzalez will only give you a, a, a really tiny taste of, of some of the um, case studies that are, are written up in, in, the, in the document. And just to reiterate um, Yusuf's point that we really need a lot more case studies, but more importantly, we need a lot more practice out there in the field because serious social dialogue is, is rather wanting at the moment in, in the field of informality. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to, to cover uh, firstly, starting off with, I want to, to focus a little bit narrower than um, a general statement about social dialogue, and we'll be focusing on collective bargaining as a particular form of social dialogue with an argument that um, we, we need to look at collective bargaining in the informal economy rather than just the broad sense of, of um, social dialogue. And then I'm going to be talking, I'll, I'll make reference to R204. I'll have a short note on gender and collective bargaining, and then present you with two of the case studies from the document, both on Liberia and Colombia, with a health warning on the Liberia one, in the sense that um, the good practice that it demonstrated when it was written up has rather fallen apart since then, but I'll explain that when I get to it, and then some concluding remarks. So just to, to focus initially on why we want to, as we go, focus specifically on collective bargaining is that we, we would, argue that the, the, the very principles that apply in the formal world with trade unions and employers need to be applied in, in the world of informality. And what do we mean by that? We, we mean that we are looking for formal agreements 
We're looking for formal agreed rules of engagement. We're looking for dispute mechanisms in the event of, of not agreeing to, not reaching agreement and also dispute mechanisms in the event of breaking the agreement. And we're talking about really referencing the principles that are contained in ILO Conventions 98 and 154. So I'm going to be talking specifically of how we see collective bargaining as it applies to self-employed and own account workers with collective bargaining as a mechanism for moving um, and changing the conditions of work of self-employed and own account workers. The informal um, employed workers that Yusuf referred to in his introductory remarks will be covered more by the next speaker. So our argument as we go is that informal self-employed own account workers do have a dependent relationship. They are not independent um, entrepreneurs who simply float around. They, they require, um, often require permission from local authorities to work in the, for example, in the case of street vendors or waste pickers. They're completely dependent on that permission to, to do their work. Um, they require infrastructure provision and so forth. So they have needs which need to be engaged upon with those that, on whom they are, de are dependent. And this kind of engagement is happening all the time on an informal basis between informal self-employed workers and these various public authorities and sometimes private authorities, but not in a particularly formalized way. So we're arguing that we need to see a significant paradigm shift that sees the, all these entities that informal self-employed workers engage with and primarily with local authorities, but often with other levels of government and private, private companies that we need to see them as being in the equivalent space of an employer in the, the usual traditional trade union employer collective bargaining arrangements. And just to point out that ILO recommendation 204 makes reference to the right of workers and employers to freedom of association to organize and to bargain collectively. And of course, this is a simply a repeat of the principles in the various ILO conventions on collective bargaining, but it's specifically in the context of R204, which covers informality, including um, self-employment. So just a note on, on gender and collective bargaining and why collective bargaining is so important to gender. First point being that collective bargaining um, is the basis for, for arriving at equity in access to livelihoods and then also to conditions, the very conditions in those livelihoods. And secondly, that in the process of collective bargaining, particularly if one advances the election and of, of women leadership in the first place, it provides a space for serious empowerment of women leaders of, of, of workers. So the first case study that I want to refer to, and as I said, there is a bit of a health warning to this one in the sense that um, it hasn't ended very well. Um, but the first one is the case of street vendors in Monrovia, Liberia, where 86% of the workforce is informal, of whom 69% are, are self-employed. And in Liberia, we have a large um, traders union. Um, it's registered as a trade union and is an affiliate of the Liberia Labor Congress and also of StreetNet International, this organization being Feptual, which represents the, the traders, particularly of Monrovia. And these members of Feptual were in constant conflict with the Monrovia city authorities, particularly around solid waste management. But after a, a, a 
process of, of three years and more through a process of negotiation that was kind of brought to a head through these conflicts. In 2018, um, an agreement was reached, a memorandum of understanding between the city and Feptiwal, which covered um, all the points that you can see laid out in this slide, including um, the layout and allocation of vending spots, the collection of annual permit fees, um, a regime for collection of waste, penalties for non-compliance and a dispute resolution mechanism. So very much like a pretty traditional trade union employer um, collective agreement, but between the street vendors and the city. So this is a picture of, of one of the uh, block meetings. The workers are organized in blocks across the city. And this was a consultation meeting in 2019. Um, so having reached this rather unique collective agreement, um, unfortunately, since the case study was written up, both the, 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 um, the, the regular meetings that were supposed to take place no longer take place. The Monrovia City Council basically started to ignore the, the agreement and the union didn't use the dispute clause to hold the MCC into account. So there are lessons here, both for resilient organization and also for the importance of consistent commitment of municipal officials. Often the difficulty that we face and that membership-based organizations face on the ground is that um, agreements are reached in the context of particular political um, battles and, and perhaps with the support of a particular political leader. And when the leadership changes or the political, uh, political party changes, um, the commitment to the, the agreement starts to lapse. So uh, the, any agreements need to be deeply rooted, particularly when the agreements are with municipalities, deeply rooted in the officialdom. The second case study is um, that of Colombia, where, and, and it's a, a case study of waste pickers, informal recyclers who collect largely on the streets, but also in the landfills in Colombia, um, where again, a high degree of informality in, this, in the society as a whole. Um, and in, the, in that context, large numbers of informal recyclers organized under the banner of, of a national association and a, a, a very large city-based organization in Bogota, where the formalization of the organized workforce first began, uh, triggered by privatization of solid waste in 1994. And that led to um, years of conflict between the organized waste pickers and the city of Bogota and ultimately a constitutional court ruling um, in 2012, which gave the waste pickers the exclusive right to collect recyclables and to be compensated by the municipalities. And the constitutional court gave an instruction to every municipality that it should negotiate an implementation plan. And so in this case, the legal action and the legal victory really allowed for the opening of the collective bargaining space. This is uh, Nora Padilla, who was one of the original leaders of the uh, Bogota organized waste pickers, third generation Bogota waste picker. Um, so the outcomes in Colombia were that not every city has yet been in compliance with the order that they negotiate by 2015. But um, by the middle of last year, 25 cities had reached agreement with their local organized um, waste picker organizations. And many of those agreements covered the points that are listed below. Firstly, uh, remuneration. In other words, a small remuneration paid directly 
to the waste pickers via their organizations, which is an income in addition to the income achieved through sales of recyclables. So it's a kind of environmental compensation um, that the city makes basically in recognition of the fact that these informal waste pickers save the city huge amounts of money by diverting waste from the landfills. Um, and various cities have reached different, the different aspects in their agreements, provision of warehouses, vehicles, protected clothing, and so forth. The, the agreements vary from city to city, but it's made a massive difference both to the working conditions as well as to the incomes of the workers involved. And at the same time, as a win-win, it's massively improved the volumes of recycling in Colombia as a whole. Jane, I'm so terribly sorry to interrupt you, but I was wondering if you would mind trying to wrap up the next yes. few minutes. I hope that's I'm possible. Wrap, I'm yeah. wrapping up now, yeah. So in conclusion, um, the, the case studies show that collective bargaining can play a very critical role in both improving and achieving gender equity in the livelihoods and working conditions of self-employed workers, but that a conceptual mind shift is absolutely necessary. And particularly um, a mind shift in relation to the, the, the formal status of worker organizations and trade unions. In many, many countries, informal worker organizations are not allowed to register as trade unions. They're not included in statutory tripartite forums and so on. So not only is there a mind shift change necessary, but also um, significant legislative changes are necessary in, in many, many countries in order to make this collective bargaining possible for informal workers. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jane, and I'm so sorry for rushing you. Um, I think you, you made some very important points, and I fully agree with you that uh, collective bargaining is really the key to change. And uh, I think it was also important you raised the issue of uh, self-employed. They are dependent on others, uh, so they should also have the same rights as other workers. Now uh, we are going to hear from the, from the government of Spain. So we're going to have the government perspective and more precisely how the government of Spain is fighting informal work. So I'm now giving the floor to Gonzalo Jimenez Coloma. You also have 10 minutes for your presentation. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Veronica. Uh, thank you to uh, OECD, to, to uh, yourself and uh, the rest of the Global Deal uh, team for inviting me to participate in this uh, event. We feel uh, very much uh, committed to this uh, initiative, so it's a pleasure for us to for us to take part in any event uh, to in to enhance it. Uh, we are also glad to know about this new uh, thematic brief, uh, uh, which focus on a, a, a topic uh, uh, very much in line with our uh, vision and our mission as the labor and social security inspectorate of uh, Spain, which I represent uh, here uh, today. Uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna share with you a little uh, presentation. I only have uh, 10 minutes, but I, I hope uh, I can give you uh, a little overview of uh, what we are doing here in recent years. Um, well, let me start by uh, saying that uh, one of the most uh, important characteristics of our institutional social model is uh, uh, the, participant, the participation of social partners uh, in the governance system of uh, everything related uh, to uh, the labor uh, market. Uh, why is this? Because uh, we uh, understand that uh, a social dialogue brings uh, important uh, benefits uh, to our governance uh, system. Uh, first, uh, first reason, because uh, it's a matter of, uh, of legitimacy. Uh, the unions and the business uh, organizations uh, are uh, representatives of uh, uh, workers and employers. Uh, they are, uh, as such, uh, key players of the labor market, and uh, therefore they are uh, the best position ones to define the rules that must uh, 
must govern uh, the labor uh, relations. Second, because uh, uh, of the fact that they represent uh, opposite uh, interests and, uh, and the product of a social dialogue pro process is always a, a well-balanced uh, uh, product in itself. And, and third, because uh, it's a matter also of uh, credibility of the uh, system, uh, um, because uh, 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 when a decision uh, is made and, uh, after a social dialogue uh, process, this uh, transmits a signal of uh, credibility to the addressees of the process that it uh, constitutes uh, in itself uh, an added value to the decision that uh, uh, has to be made. Uh, well, obviously, uh, obviously, uh, uh, all, although the social dialogue is uh, in our DNA or is part of our institutional uh, system, not uh, every government has the same uh, sensitiveness uh, to uh, social dialogue. And I, I'm saying this because uh, the government that uh, came uh, to power in uh, June uh, 2018 uh, two years ago this week, uh, was very sensitive to uh, social dialogue and the importance of social partners in the, uh, in the uh, governance of our uh, social relations. Uh, so one of the first decisions this government made was to call social partners and uh, agree to them uh, on uh, setting up five uh, different boards of uh, social dialogue. Uh, one, one for employment and labor relations, one for vocational training, another one for social protection, another for equality as a cross-cutting issue, uh, touching uh, labor issues and social protection issues, and the last one about tackling informal economy. Um, of all these issues, the treatment uh, within uh, the social dialogue of the issue of a, a a fight against uh, the informal economy was uh, a particularly striking. It was a pioneering uh, initiative, at least uh, uh, for uh, Spain. And uh, what is more uh, remarkable, it was a, a decision ba uh, based on the request of the uh, businesses uh, organization. And uh, why was uh, this? Well, I think that First, uh, because a uh, uh, business organization consider that the informal economy is unfair competition uh, for those company, companies who, plays, uh, who play by the rules, who are the majority of them, uh, and put the survival of their businesses uh, at risk. And also because uh, informal economy is a liability, it's a, li a, li a liability for the uh, uh, welfare state and the social protection uh, system. And it's a liability that uh, at the end of the day must be covered by uh, those uh, who comply uh, with the rules for those who pay uh, their taxes. So this is a way uh, how uh, companies uh, uh, themselves uh, uh, end up uh, leading the uh, process of, dia of social dialogue uh, to fight against uh, the underground um, economy. Well, we can go a step further, and uh, once the social dialogue uh, is uh, open, uh, the government wanted to design and implement a, a master plan for a decent work, a, a, a plan of measures uh, against job precariousness. Uh, precariousness is an important word uh, here because uh, as a difference uh, with uh, the uh, previous political uh, period which uh, was uh, much more focused on a uh, informal economy as a way to get uh, public uh, resources for the state the, the, the new government after 2018 is more focused on, on tackling a uh, precariousness precariousness uh, uh, at work that means that uh, uh, the uh, important thing is not not only the underground economy but also recovering labor uh, rights uh, that were lost as a consequence of the uh, crisis uh, to uh, uh, fight again uh, and justify short-term temporary uh, contracts, uh, combating and discrimination uh, at work, etc. Uh, 
So the first uh, goal of this uh, master plan for decent work was uh, uh, tackling precariousness. And the second one, as you can see there, is a guarantee in a level playing uh, field. So here we are again in the um, perspective of the business uh, organizations. And uh, let me uh, uh, read a short paragraph of the uh, plan uh, that says that this plan targets uh, those who fail to comply with the employment and social security uh, rules, um, the social security law, given that fraud is economically unsustainable and socially unfair, undermining the competitiveness and productivity of Spain's economy whilst attacking workers' fundamental or basic rights. So this is a perspective uh, through which uh, 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 all the plan is uh, is built. Uh, the plan was uh, finally uh, made with a consensus uh, between the business and the uh, employees organizations and it uh, has a strong basis on international instruments mainly uh, the uh, 2030 agenda and especially the SDG 8 and obviously the, uh, the vast uh, work of the ILO about uh, decent work and all also based on a uh, tripartism. Uh, it contains uh, 75 uh, measures, uh, 55 of them operational and uh, 20 of them uh, institutional, but uh, uh, more important than uh, the specific measures uh, to be uh, adopted, I would say that uh, there are some elements that for, our, for us uh, are key in any public policy dealing with uh, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, transition from informal to uh, the formal economy. Uh, first one, leadership without a, a strong political will is impossible to, uh, to move on. Uh, second, a solid institutional framework. Here is where uh, social dialogue uh, plays uh, an important role. Uh, third, uh, you need a, a legal system that uh, works uh, uh, adequately. Uh, for you need a, a talented uh, workforce uh, without uh, people you can't uh, implement uh, any any plan and uh, the last two elements uh, have been highlighted in the uh, recent uh, years uh, for uh, every institution dealing with uh, uh, this uh, kind of things cooperation between uh, all the uh, stakeholders uh, concerned and uh, technology we are uh, very much specialized in, uh, in using uh, high technology in uh, our uh, strategies uh, uh, and we can talk a little bit about, about, about it if you want afterwards. Um, well, this is a, a results-oriented uh, plan. Uh, we have uh, had uh, very good numbers uh, after uh, 15 months of uh, uh, implementation. You can uh, see them uh, there. And uh, if you want, uh, if you have any further interest, uh, you, we can uh, provide you with uh, any figures uh, uh, you want. Especially successful has been the strategy to transform uh, short term uh, contracts uh, uh, in a tempo, in a permanent uh, ones uh, when, when they were uh, abusive and uh, the fight against uh, the bogus uh, self-employment. Also, we have uh, developed specific actions uh, in uh, uh, sectors uh, uh, where uh, precariousness uh, is uh, more uh, widespread, uh, like a, a, a platform uh, workers or meatpacking uh, sector. Um, L last, uh, Sorry, Gonzalo, uh, to interrupt you. Do you think you will be able to wrap up in a minute? Yeah, this is the last one. Thank you. Yeah, the last remark I would like to, to make is uh, about uh, uh, the international scope. We defend the same ideas uh, uh, both uh, at national and international uh, level. So uh, this is the reason why we support uh, firmly the European Labour uh, Authority, the new uh, agency created uh, to uh, uh, prevent circumvention of uh, uh, European uh, mobility uh, rules. Uh, we, we understand that we must create a trust uh, in the European Union that provides a, a protection for workers and a level playing field for uh, businesses. Uh, and the same as uh, uh, in the national uh, scope, uh, 
social partners uh, can contribute to create and that uh, a good uh, climate of uh, uh, trust and confidence uh, in the functioning of, uh, of the rules. Okay, that's uh, it. I leave it here. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Uh, I was very interested to learn about the, what the Spanish government has done to tackle precariousness. And it's really good to have these examples and success stories because we need them. We need more of these good cases which show that you can achieve a lot uh, if you want to. Uh, and, and having these short-term contracts being transformed into permanent contracts is very important. Uh, now I would like to hand over to our discussant, Professor Ocampo. Uh, we have really heard a lot here, and I think uh, there's probably many things you would like to comment on, uh, and I would like to invite you to do so. But I would also like you to please uh, specifically address the consequences for informal workers of the current pandemic. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, it is a, a great pleasure to, uh, to be in, uh, in this meeting and to uh, comment the presentations by yourself, uh, Jane, uh, and Gonzalo, and perhaps add a few more things, some of which uh, will actually be based on the ILO document that yourself presented. Uh, let me start by saying that the um, informality has been a, a major blow uh, to informal workers. Um, uh, uh, the, um, the fact that uh, many of them uh, are left without any income whatsoever uh, is uh, the most uh, important issue uh, that we have to face in, in several developing countries. Uh, let me say, for example, that in my country, Colombia, the, um, uh, it's estimated that during the, uh, the full quarantine, uh, uh, you know, only two out of uh, five workers were able to uh, uh, to work, uh, uh, and the, of the three out of five that were not able to go to their work, uh, only at most uh, one out, one of them, uh, that is about 20% of the labor force, can uh, work digitally, uh, and they uh, uh, and generate income. So there are there are two uh, groups of informal workers. Uh, that they uh, are affected. Uh, one actually, well, or let me say one that is not affected, uh, which are uh, generally the, uh, the rural workers, uh, the peasants, let's say, which uh, can continue to work. Uh, uh, they, they do face problems, particularly the marketing of their products, uh, but uh, they are able to, uh, to work and, uh, and make uh, their incomes. Uh, in, uh, in contrast to that, the urban, uh, informal workers uh, are in the worst possible situation uh, for the reason that uh, uh, I already mentioned uh, that they have no income uh, whatsoever. Uh, uh, furthermore, uh, many of them are not strictly poor. Uh, and for example, in Latin America, they have an extensive conditional cash transfer programs. Uh, some of them uh, would not be able to, uh, to get uh, you know, one of the traditional cash transfers. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the government has to develop, uh, and, and most countries have actually developed additional uh, transfers, uh, as well as other programs uh, to support uh, those households. Um, uh, the other programs, I said, for example, are uh, the substitute, for example, for school meals. Uh, so they have to uh, uh, give money or uh, food uh, to feed the, the children. Uh, 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 they, they also uh, give uh, you know, other types of support, for example, uh, guarantee access to water, uh, which is a major uh, problem uh, for all the population uh, facing the COVID-19. Um, let, me, um, let me say that uh, I think there are very interesting uh, uh, issues in the presentations. Uh, and, and, and perhaps let me, uh, let me mention uh, some issues that I think are essential uh, in terms of the agenda. Uh, when you work with uh, informal uh, workers or informal firms. Uh, and let me say uh, also as a, glo a global deal advisors in the beginning of this initiative, uh, that uh, I push for this issue of informality to be in the agenda. Uh, 
uh, because it really was not in the agenda, really. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very happy that we're discussing informality today, uh, because uh, for, uh, as you have said, the 60% uh, of workers in a typical developing country, and in many of them, more than three fourths, uh, are informal workers. So this is a really major issue in developing uh, countries. Let me say. So let me let me say what I think is the agenda uh, that has to be uh, uh, integrated in these integrated frameworks that the ILO document uh, mentions. The first is the access to social protection. Uh, 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 some social protection programs, uh, uh, health and, and and pensions in particular. Uh, but if you have, uh, you know, some form of uh, uh, employment insurance or unemployment benefit, let's say, uh, uh, you know, they don't reach the uh, informal workers. Uh, and therefore, a, a system that guarantees universal access to health, uh, at least uh, universal access to a basic pension, uh, I, I think are some of the essential elements that have to include, be included in this program. The second is skills. Uh, skill development, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, essential for uh, for making uh, you know an appropriate income to uh, let's say upgrade the conditions of work uh, and uh, income generation uh, of all these uh, informal workers. Uh, the third, uh, I, I would put on the, the very broad uh, concept uh, mentioned the ILO doc uh, ILO document of enterprise development. Uh, uh, so this is, a, a, you can say, well, for self-employed workers or for micro-enterprises in which many informal workers uh, a, 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 a spend, you know, work, let's say, uh, are, you know, very important issues. And let me say, uh, <clears throat> this includes at least the, for the following issue, the fair regulation for, uh, I mean, the case of a, a, a street uh, waste collector, uh, that the Jane mentioned in, 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 my, in my country uh, is one of those. Uh, <coughs> also, the the system of to register business uh, it, uh, to, to have a simplified system for very small enterprises. Uh, the the incentives uh, that small business have, um, uh, which may be uh, uh, on the one hand tax incentives. Uh, but also, uh, and very importantly, uh, access to finance. So, what the how you uh, develop the uh, the development banking system, uh, and or use uh, uh, state banks uh, to guarantee some access to finance to uh, very small enterprises. Uh, and, 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 and last but not least, uh, the organization or the associations uh, of small producers. Uh, which are essential uh, uh, to uh, uh, to have uh, better uh, deals with with large business, uh, or uh, as in the case of the uh, street waste collectors, uh, with governments, uh, with municipal government in that particular case. So these are all areas in which uh, uh, working together uh, in, in between uh, you know the uh, informal workers and informal businesses. Uh, 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 are essential to uh, to uh, make uh, viable micro enterprises and small enterprises, uh, but also to upgrade uh, the uh, the uh, the work uh, of those uh, who labor in those very small enterprises. I think the by the way, some of the issues that were presented by Gonzalo in Spain uh, are you know uh, I think uh, are very important uh, for uh, uh, this particular issue. Now. Uh, Finally, I, I think the, the issue of social dialogue uh, is, of course, uh, absolutely essential. Um, uh, let me perhaps, however, make the specific comment that this is not only about tripartite uh, negotiations, uh, it's generally about quadripartite, uh, because uh, 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 the uh, you know, informal workers and informal businesses uh, are not generally well covered uh, by labor unions uh, or uh, business uh, associations, organizations, uh, and therefore uh, they do. They have. We have to promote uh, for them to organize themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was, of course, interesting. If trade unions organize some of the informal workers. Uh, it is, of course, also very good. Uh, if some of the uh, enterprise associations uh, uh, 
uh, and you know, include the uh, small businesses, uh, but they generally don't. Uh, neither of them. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, organizing uh, uh, the uh, informal uh, workers and informal uh, enterprises for negotiations uh, is very important. Some of those negotiations, by the way, uh, will be with business, with large business, uh, uh, as well as the state, the state uh, for the regulation, uh, but also uh, in some cases for the businesses, uh, because they, you know, they do business that are relevant for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for the governments, uh, either local governments uh, or national governments. Now, uh, uh, so uh, uh, the promotion of those organizations and the support for those organizations uh, has to be an essential element uh, of the social dialogue uh, in this particular case. Uh, and, and let me uh, uh, finally say in this regard uh, that I found, of, of course, uh, very good uh, the uh, point by, by Jane, uh, they, that they have to be uh, uh, formal agreements uh, and formal dispute settlement mechanisms uh, uh, to guarantee that those uh, formal agreements uh, are, are uh, are met by all the parties. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure I, I would use the word collective bargaining for that because uh, your collective bargaining is usually uh, uh, association uh, uh, related to negotiations between labor unions and business. Uh, but uh, you know, if, if she wants to use that concept for that, uh, it's fine uh, for me. Uh, but I think we should emphasize the two. Uh, uh, prerequisites that uh, that she did, uh, which is a uh, formal agreements uh, with dispute settlement mechanisms uh, are in place. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, I am really nice as a global deal advisor that the issue of informality is uh, really the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Campo. You raised a number of uh, important issues that I hope we will have some time to discuss now. You, you um, refer to the following areas, access to social protection, that is of course key for informal workers, um, regulation, skills development, access to finance. These are all crucial issues. So I'm happy we have some time left for discussion. Uh, we have prepared a number of questions for you, uh, but I see that people are really active on the chat. Uh, so I would first like to see if one or two or three of our participants would like to make a comment or ask a question to one of our presenters, or if you want to contribute with any other examples uh, of formalization strategies. Uh, that would be also be very welcome. I have followed the chat screen a bit, so I, I see that there, are, there were a few questions there. But first, I, I will ask Anna uh, to help me if we have anybody who has requested the floor. Yes, we have a first question from Pat Horn at StreetNet International. Um, I'll just uh, unmute you, Pat. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to make a bit of an intervention as was requested about um, how this all plays out uh, during the time of COVID. Um, I've been, I'm based in South Africa and uh, in Africa, the COVID uh, reached us a little bit later than in Europe, but we could see it coming. And so our governments um, started to react um, we had the advantage of being able to uh, to react earlier and to have some positive impact on infections. Um, so as governments in Africa started to uh, impose lockdowns, um, we uh, workers in the informal economy, uh, as uh, previous speakers have mentioned, uh, were going to be stopped from working as were many others but the workers in the informal economy in most cases had no social safety net. In South Africa, the first thing that we did when this happened was to start pushing for a income grant for everybody who was stopped from working. Uh, we had a four week battle and eventually we succeeded and we did get an income grant. It was extremely small though. It was um, 350 South African rands, which is, um, around about 20 uh, US dollars per month. Um, 
And then when it was agreed, there have been problems with that income grant actually being paid out. We share that experience with Brazil, where they also fought for an income grant against President Bolsonaro, and it was agreed. But the implementation, the payout has not been happening. So it's meant that uh, people uh, haven't been able to get social protection uh, relief. Um, so we've been noticing what's been happening in some countries where people have seen the need to um, really uh, engage with their governments. And one interesting example is Sierra Leone, uh, who, where the ordinary people, it's not the first time they've had an experience like that. They've just recently defeated uh, the Ebola um, uh, epidemic, which they had. And so they basically started to interact with government and have informal collective bargaining with government about how to start working with their members about uh, working differently in the markets, having social spacing, um, having uh, using sanitizers, et cetera, um, in order to keep down the level of the infection, knowing that, they, that their government was not going to be able to give them an income grant, uh, knowing that there were no resources, knowing that the borders were now closed and so therefore there was going to be shortages of certain products. So we, we saw an extremely impressive level of cooperation between government and the Sierra Leone Traders Union, which operates all around the country, which I think had a major impact on keeping their, their numbers infections low, even among people uh, in the informal economy who before this were working at very um, what we found in South Africa, uh, where we do have, we don't call it a quadripartite negotiating situation, we call it a tripartite plus, for reasons which we can go into if there's time. Um, and uh, so we, we've been participating in interaction with our government. Our tripartite plus arrangement has often not worked very well for us. It's worked in a situation where it's worked in such a way that uh, we are always the uh, Cinderella constituency and we uh, are sidelined all the time. But interestingly, when, with uh, COVID uh, coming along, the government has been extremely conscious of the fact that um, the people who have no social security cushion uh, were the most vulnerable and having a large uh, population of vulnerable people in the country was not going to be helpful for the country as we went into this COVID issue. So we found the government listening to us more than before. Uh, and we were able to, to basically make influence to some extent the regulations adopted by the government. Because as uh, workers saw that all they could get at best was 350 rand a month. The main focus has turned to getting people back to work. As the African governments have had to in any event relax their lockdowns because they've had to get their economies back uh, for the sake of livelihoods. Um, uh, our, our efforts have largely been on negotiating to get workers in the informal economy back to work. In South Africa, we now have a phased um, relaxing of, of regulations, and we have been able to get the uh, waste pickers back to work uh, at the beginning of, of May. Uh, we, we managed to get uh, food traders um, back to work early in, in, in April. So now the issue is uh, to try to make sure that um, while the government is passing regulations... I'm sorry, uh, Pat, I'm so, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we have several people that want to speak and that have asked questions in, in the chat, and I want to give space also to the other participants. So can you please wrap up? Okay, so um, let me uh, move straight to, to the issue about... Uh, uh, getting into tripartite uh, arrangements in each country. In South Africa, we've worked with our tripartite body called NEDLAC, National Economic Development and Labor Council. And in Senegal, um, they, there they have a tripartite arrangement uh, with the High Council on Social Dialogue, where the workers in the informal economy are part of the workers' uh, um, uh, caucus and the employers in the informal economy are part of the employers caucus. 
And that one uh, seems to be better in terms of uh, workers getting mainstreamed because now with economic recovery, it's the time for us to ensure that the formalization of the informal economy takes root right now as economies are coming out of COVID in the rights-based manner, which is promoted in recommendation 204. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pat. Anna, did you see anybody else that raised the hand or shall we move to the chat? Uh, yes, I have um, Jose Antonio Aldevan, who I believe is with the OECD and uh, after that, uh, Helen Breeze with ITF. Okay, great. Hello, good afternoon, and, and thank you for, for, for this very interesting dialogue. Uh, I am in charge of the Division of Global Relations with Latin America, and obviously this issue is very relevant for Latin America, as some uh, speakers already mentioned. I wanted to follow up a bit on the, on the last question about the, the COVID crisis. Uh, we, obviously, it has created a lot of challenges, in particular for informal, the informal. This could give some opportunities, in particular, in this role of, of the social dialogue uh, with respect to informality. Because on the one hand, it has shown uh, some of the benefits of formality for many people. Before, it, this was a dialogue that this didn't happen so much because both the government and the informal economy were quite, uh, let's say, they were comfortable with the situation and probably didn't take a lot of policies to, to solve this issue. And now, now it has been, become much clearer that if you are formal, it's easy to get to have a, a, an income and, a, and also to be covered by safety nets to support in this in this type of, of situations. Uh, at the same time, governments have been forced to interact with the informal economy, and this could be an opportunity to set up these social dialogue mechanisms to to, to get your views on, on how we can support this uh, happening. And, and also, I have another question about the organizing formal labor. You said that, well, we, we need to support these groups or these, but I think that in some cases, these groups are actually more gangs or, or uh, some uh, uh, groups that uh, seek uh, rent seeking and, and, and sometimes even part of the, of the um, well, uh, organized crime in, in, some, in some cases. So it's very important to see how, how can we support uh, these issues. A uh, very last point, uh, well, we are actually organizing as well from the OECD a lab ministerial on informality and social inclusion uh, in times of COVID in, in July. And, and well, we will uh, try to keep the link between this dialogue because I guess there's a very specific panel of involving citizens in policy making that can be very relevant, the discussion that you are having. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anna, who was next, did you say? Uh, Helen Breeze with the ITF. Helen, please, you have the floor. Hi there. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can hear you fine. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much for the discussion and it's something that is increasingly important to um, to unions around the world, what, what to do and um, how to reach out to informal workers. Um, normally our, our legal director would be here today but he, he can't be here so he just asked me to um, make a brief intervention on his behalf today. Um, we just wanted to, to note our support for social dialogue and collective bargaining um, as a most effective way, uh, um, as many have said today, of, of transitioning from the informal to the formal economy and point out so that we have um, at the International Transport Workers Federation, I should have said, um, there are several ITFs, um, uh, we have several projects on organising workers and non standard forms of employment and others working in the informal economy despite the lack of an enabling environment for us to do so. Um, between 2013 and 2016, uh, we had a big push to support affiliates in targeted countries to organise informal transport workers. Um, the results of that, um, that membership growth, um, although not well recorded and, and difficult to measure, um, at a minimum we would say it exceeded 60,000 uh, workers. Um, for example, um, there, there are different levels of success. So, ATGWU in Uganda claims at least 57,000 
new and former worker members, Nepali Rickshaw Union, uh, 1,671 new members on its formation, Colombia and 2,250, for example. Um, but not only were these workers organized, but um, we wanted to note that new collective agreements were also signed, uh, for example, in Togo, Niger, Senegal, Cambodia, Colombia, and the Philippines. And, and I think um, the target was to pass there for this particular big push that we wanted to, to make on behalf of informal transport workers. Um, and we'd be very happy to discuss um, and provide information and best practices as, as, as if we can with, with um, colleagues in that respect. And, and I know that we've worked with WeGo in, in, on particular platforms before and hopefully we can continue. Um, we just wanted to take very quickly highlight as well um, that workers in the informal economy often very visibly working but in an unregulated environment but we just wanted to take the opportunity here to highlight what we see as an impending humanitarian crisis of the opposite kind. Workers in a usually very highly regulated environment working invisibly out at sea and and it's not the point of this call but just to take a few seconds just we hope to highlight to um the states and, and business and other actors um on this wonderful platform bringing people together that um you, they'll be aware that two million seafarers are operating vessels at any one time 90 percent of the world's goods are being moved in normal circumstances at least a hundred thousand of them every month need to be changed over to comply with international regulations that keep them safe keep their shipping safe and keep global supply chains open um, the global economy depends on them businesses all of us depend on them for are in uninterrupted supply of essential goods, food, medical supplies that continues throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, many states have rightly identified seafarers as key workers, but um, when not seeing the states facilitating their transit and ports of entry and exit where they can have their right to be repatriated at the end of their uh, term at sea. So now we've got two rounds of crew replacements have now been missed. That's 200,000 at least seafarers who are kind of effectively abandoned in, in situ and they don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, some of them have been at sea for a year um, and, and the limits on their working time are to protect them. They're in a very intense uh, working situation. Um, lack of certainty in this current situation as their mental health issues, um, increase in fatigue, um, they don't know when they'll see their families again, they won't be able to get back to their families if crisis uh, occurs at home. Um, and, and this is a risk to human life, environmental disaster, the durability of global supply chains, which we need to carry on the world as best we can in this crisis. Um, but we just see time is of the essence here and we're receiving desperate messages from seafarers, um, reports of refusals to work, even of suicides. And we just wanted to take the opportunity to say, this is unnecessary. The maritime industry has come together to put protocols in place. The shipping companies are on board, the International Chamber of Shipping, the ILO, the IMO, welfare organizations have all come together to put IMO protocols in place to ensure that crew changes can happen. And um, we can't agree to any more extensions beyond the 15th of June and we're concerned about the issues of how can whether consent is really real for the seafarers out there working to keep our goods coming to us in this crisis and I um, we just wanted to urge in the last few seconds now I'll, I'll give up the floor but just any states out there who can commit openly to allowing passages of seafarers, uh, change of crew, and um, whether states might be able to work together to ensure that that happens across countries, uh, any businesses that can use their leverage to assist uh, seafarers, um, whether that's the leverage they have in their host states or um, with, with in, in countries where they have leverage as investors and, and, and um, big uh, employers and inquire along your supply chains and see what's going on because there are people out there stranded and um, they're at the end of their tether and it's very difficult for us to watch that and we have yes, until Helen. to do to um, try and make a change of that so thank you so much I'm sorry to hijack the floor um, in, in a sense but just to um, uh, try and thank make a call for some change thank you so much everyone and thank you for thank you Helen thank you
and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I think we all heard your call and, and the urgency of this whole issue. Um, so thank you for raising this. And uh, now I would like to see with my colleagues, uh, Andrea and Sophie, if you would be able to pick out one or two questions from the chat. I saw there were several questions before. And then I would like to invite the speakers to respond. Andrea and Sophie, did you find any yes. particular question you would like to read out? Well, the chat group has been very active and many participants have shared interesting information and publications. Um, so I will try to pick up a couple of questions. One of them is from Margarita Lisenkova. And the question is, can you highlight the role of private companies vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis informal workers, especially for, rural, for the rural economy? And if I understand this is about the role of multinational organizations uh, to promote formalization in particular in the rural economy. Another question I would like to highlight is from uh, uh, Mauro Uceta, and the question is the following. What would be the role of nation states in the transition from the informal to the formal economy? What kind of legal reform do you think should be implemented in order to achieve this goal? And perhaps finally, I would like to also highlight the question from uh, Joss Huber from the government of the Netherlands. And the question is the following. Uh, would self-employed workers be uh, better Andrea, organized? I don't know if I was the only one who lost. Uh, Veronica, I, I was reading the last question from uh, Jaws, uh, and the question is the following. Uh, would self-employed workers be better organized by trade unions or by employers' organizations? Thank you, Andrea. That were lots of questions. Maybe it's my interconnection being stable because I, I lost you for a while there. Uh, but I hope our speakers caught everything, <laughs> even if I didn't. Uh, and this time I'm going to ask uh, Professor Kamp if you would like to start. We have had several interesting examples from the participants. There were also a number of questions. I would just let you pick and choose because we have so little time left. So I would say, well, four minutes each. We don't really have more, so you can pick and choose. There were also questions about how to organize informal workers, but I let you choose. Yeah, thank you very much. Let, let me start actually with the last question. Uh, I, I, I think in many cases, it's neither the labor unions nor the employer organization. That was my point uh, in my presentation. Uh, is for them to self-organize. Um, uh, as informal workers uh, or as small uh, small businesses, um, uh, and the, I think the the governments have a good responsibility, an important responsibility to guarantee uh, that they are um, uh, that they are uh, uh, organized, so that to support the creation of those organizations or associations of different character. Uh, that are important for the negotiations. Uh, second, uh, in, in relation to the, the question of, uh, uh, of uh, negotiations, uh, let me say that in some cases there are uh, bipartisan uh, negotiations between uh, you know, small business or informal workers and governments, sometimes uh, between the, the small businesses and the small, uh, informal workers with large enterprises. And I think that issue is very important uh, a, a for uh, rural areas, of course, to guarantee that peasants uh, a, a do have a, uh, a you know a good access to inputs on the one hand, but also uh, to marketing their products. Um, a, and actually, associations of agricultural producers are very very important for that purpose. A, again, a, that's so, a policy that can be explicitly supported by governments. Uh, in order to uh, to guarantee a better income and better uh, negotiating conditions uh, for for small businesses, uh, and finally on the on the comment by OECD, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, say that uh, it is of course uh, uh, important, uh, and many Latin American countries have done that. Uh, that the, during the COVID nineteen crisis, there are instruments additional for the additional to the tra conditional tra cash transfer for the poor. Because many of the informal workers, particularly in urban areas, are not necessarily the poorest. I, I, and therefore, there has to be a, a kind of a support uh, for vulnerable populations in urban areas uh, through basically through additional income uh, cash transfers of some sort 
uh, uh, many, many Latin American countries have been deciding that, uh, as well as uh, in a few cases, also mechanisms to support employment directly, uh, which is, of course, a policy that has been done uh, by several European countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Now I would like to ask Jane, uh, could you try to address some of these questions? I think you might have some uh, uh, ideas of how you organize informal workers because that's exactly what you have been doing and I think some of your, your case studies uh, pointed. Okay, um, so there were a couple of questions relating to organizing. The one was, you know, where do they best belong? Uh, do they belong in employers' organizations or in trade unions? I think we would argue that, particularly when it comes to self-employed, um, own account workers who, as I explained at the beginning of my um, input, have a dependency. They, they're not free, independent entrepreneurs with access to capital, etc. So their natural uh, common interests lie with the organized formal workforce in trade unions. But I think as has been pointed out, they're often self-organized in associations or other forms of organization. But the natural alliance is with um, the trade union movement. And so, you know, we would argue it, it, the, the answer to the question is not necessarily whether they're in the trade union, but that they are regarded as, first and foremost, as workers that their identity is recognized as workers, that their dependence on institutions and so on is recognized, and that in, particularly in the national space of negotiations, that they be given space within the, as, as Pat argued earlier, within the, um, the same space that the trade unions occupied, so that their, their natural alliance is, is, is brought together. Um, in terms of the impact on, of COVID on organizing, which was one of the questions, what's been very interesting to observe is that while it's presented huge difficulties to many, many organizations on the ground, it has nevertheless thrown up um, and exposed the dependence that many economies have on self-employed workers. So again, taking the South African example, um, one of the reasons why we won the argument to allow uh, food vendors to go back to the streets in, in, uh, you know, in safe ways was there suddenly it was recognized the extent to which food vendors are a key part of food, providing food security and that large portions of the population depend on those vendors for purchasing fresh food. So, you know, it's, it's increased, it's helped to throw up and make visible um, the, the informal workforce. Um, and there was a question too about organizing migrants. Um, and just to say that most informal sectors have large numbers of migrant workers in them. And again, most are self-organized and organized into the organizations that, that, that we work with. Um, there was also a question of legal reform. Um, and we would argue that the biggest area for legal reform is in labor legislation. That part of, and, and R204 calls for that. It calls for an alignment of laws um, to make way for formalization of, of informal workers. And we would argue that labor legislation is the key area. I think that's, that's it for the questions directed at me. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, I would now like to ask Gonzalo, maybe you would like to pick up the question about self-employed organizations, or you, you're also free to comment on the other questions uh, and the interventions. Yes, uh, well, I can say something about uh, what uh, ha happened here in Spain in, in the last 15 or 20 years about uh, self-employed uh, uh, workers. Uh, and uh, the point is that uh, it's not only that they are more now, but uh, I think that it's important to, to highlight that they are 
much more diverse. So uh, there are a, a wide typology of uh, self-employed uh, workers, uh, some of them more similar to, uh, to uh, employers or uh, little entrepreneurs. Uh, other much more similar to employees. So I think that it, it's not a good idea to think that they uh, can be represented by unions or, or business organizations. I totally agree with uh, Professor Ocampo uh, about that. In fact, uh, an interesting uh, thing in Spain is that um, we have ac accepted uh, absolutely that uh, uh, unions uh, represent uh, informal uh, workers or uh, irregular uh, migrants uh, uh, without uh, any problem. Even we have accepted uh, uh, that a business organization uh, act on behalf of uh, domestic employers, which is something kind of uh, strange. But we, uh, mm, we have uh, reached the conclusion that uh, uh, unions and business organizations cannot represent self-employed workers. So, uh, with uh, uh, the passing of the years, uh, the self-employed workers have uh, developed their own organizations and they have a, a parallel debate and a par parallel dialogue uh, with the government when uh, uh, something important for them must be uh, treated, but must be dealt with. Uh, and uh, well, this is something uh, not easy to, uh, accept for uh, social partners sometimes, but uh, at the end of the day, I, I think it's uh, the only right uh, solution because, uh, as, as I say, they have a very wide uh, uh, typology and uh, uh, they must uh, find uh, their own uh, associations to represent their interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to uh, invite Yusuf for any concluding remarks and also if you would like to pick up on one of these uh, questions or remarks. Uh, thank you, Veronica, and thank you to all the uh, persons who have uh, uh, put forward comments and questions. I think these were very useful. And for the sake of you know saving the time, because I think we are a little bit behind the uh, 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 schedule, I would like to to say a couple of things uh, and with the hope you know that this uh, concluding comments will respond to some of the questions and the comments that were uh, put forward by the people who are participating in this webinar. Uh, obviously I think it's uh, I think uh, we all agree that uh, this is uh, I think uh, a challenge the, the the question of the informal economy given all the uh, the challenges it poses to workers who are in informal employment but also to enterprises and uh, also to governments, as I mentioned uh, earlier on in my uh, introductory remarks. And therefore, I think all the actors have, uh, I think, a responsibility to, 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 to uh, work together in order to find the appropriate solutions and the appropriate responses to the, to the challenge of promoting uh, formalization. And I think it was already mentioned that, you know, the COVID-19 is also adding to the adding pressure, I think, on the actors, I think, to act even more quickly and also with the lasting solutions to this challenge. But like here also to mention the, uh, the critical role of government. Uh, if you look at the recommendation 204, I think it says clearly that government has a critical role, or cr critical role to play in enabling the transition to the formal economy. It carries the primary responsibility to put in place a conducive public policy environment without which I think it would be vain to expect that, you know, we will, you know, move forward and promote formalization. So it's a critical role of the government. It has the primary responsibility to put in place a conducive policy environment. Somebody mentioned, you know, legal framework. Yes, including a sound national legal framework and also to ensure compliance with existing laws and regulations. I think it's important also to to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of not only having an appropriate legal framework, but also to ensure compliance with this, this legal framework, including through imposition of dissuasive sanctions when violations occur. Also, I think within the, the, the remit of government intervention, cooperation between the different government departments and agencies, like tax, tax authorities, social security institutions, labor inspectorates, training institutions, 
public employment services also is essential. And finally, and also crucially is, and this is what also I mentioned earlier on in my presentation, is it is the responsibility of the government to organize social dialogue, inviting the social partners to the table in order to discuss the challenges, but also the measures to be taken together to promote formalization. And then of course, this brings me to the issue of the role of the social partners. I think also employers and workers organizations, also uh, mainstream, I would say, also they, they and there are examples that are making efforts, I think, to reach out to the, to the, to the informal uh, workers, to the informal economic units, uh, to, 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 to support, for example, those informal workers, you know, that want like to organize and to, and to in order to defend their, their, their right. Similarly, for the economic unit, also employers organizations and the examples that we have given in the, in the brief showing how employers organizations also are making effort in order to play their role when it comes to promoting this issue of formalization. Very, very last comment regarding this question, who should organize the self-employed? I think it's, it's, it depends on how the, the self-employed themselves, how they see themselves. Do they see themselves as entrepreneurs? They might, you know, wish, for example, to join employers' organizations, or they see themselves are, for example, dependent employees, and they might also choose to the to the to join the workers' organization. I think there is no sort of, you know, a clear a clear cut conclusion to the or or or, or approach to this. But I think it's 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 open, and I think depending, uh, as I said, on how those uh, self employed see themselves. Okay, and you can see that, for example, that sometimes workers organize, are organizing both some as maybe also in private organizations. So it depends very much on how, you know, it's either way, I would say. So with this, I think I would like to conclude my remarks. And again, I think to thank the, the organizers for the opportunity to be here and also to contribute to this uh, very, I think, enriching debate. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Um, I'm afraid that we have uh, really run out of time. It's already 4.40 in Paris and we were supposed to finish at uh, 4.30, but we have had a really rich discussion and I was really pleased to see that so many of the participants wanted to react uh, both by using the chat function and by raising hands to, to um, make comments and, and ask questions. And a big, big thank you to all our speakers. Uh, I think it's been really interesting. And the fact that we don't have any more time means that I won't have time to try to conclude this discussion either, uh, which is both a deception and a relief because I think it would have been quite difficult. Uh, we heard uh, many different things today and there were some very good examples that we can learn from, from Diego's work, from also what the Spanish government has done. And they were also very interested to hear from South Africa and, and, and the, uh, Streetnet, I think, was the name of the organization, and also from the ITF, and some of the, the challenges faced by uh, seafarers. Um, so again, a very, very big thank you to all of you, uh, and I hope that you will join us in our next webinar on the future work. Uh, we have not announced the date yet. It most likely will be later this month, but we'll, we will send out an invitation uh, closer to the time of the meeting. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you again in other meetings. Thank you and goodbye.